to be in the actual car that won the very first race that Porsche ever ran. What a treat this is. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. It's not very often we get uh, automotive royalty on the show, but that's what this car is. This is a Porsche 356 SL. This car is a Le Mans car. This is the car that was there at the dawn of the whole Porsche racing empire. In fact, it's one of the very first cars that they raced. I can't even put a value on this car because it is such a historically important automobile. And it's in private hands right now, and it's been restored by our friend, Rod Emery. Now, you remember, Rod, he was here before. He had some uh, really cool 356 Outlaws. In fact, his company coined the term Outlaw for Porsches. Let's meet Rod again. Rod, come on in. Good to see you, my friend. Hi, Jay. Thanks wow, for having me on a, again. What a piece of history this is. This is a Gramund. Am I saying it right? Gramund. Gramund. Gramund Coupe means it was built in Gramund, Austria. Then the very first Porsches were built there, right? How many did they build? Well, there were 50 road-going cars that mm -hmm. were built, and uh, they were built in Gmund, Austria, and then Porsche made their entry back into Germany in 1950-51. My friend Jerry Seinfeld's got one of the early Gmund coupes. That, that was, it's an unrestored car, but this car is the beginning of the Porsche racing dynasty, isn't it? It really is. Uh, in 1950, at the Paris Auto Show, uh, the organizers of the 24 Hours of Le Mans invited the Porsche family to enter a car in the 1951 race. And at the time, Porsche had just begun building their steel-bodied cars, but they had a handful of leftover bodies that were the aluminum bodies built in Gmund. So they made the determination that for Le Mans, they wanted to use one of their aluminum bodies. And so what they did is they took those cars, they took four of them, and did the preparation on the car and testing to develop the cars into race cars so that they could show up at Le Mans in 1951 with two cars. And this particular car, uh, the number 46 car, uh, was one of those cars. And then there was a number 47 car. Uh, the 47 car crashed in night practice. And this particular car uh, entered the race, was uh, the only car to, to enter. And they took first place in the 1100 cc class, wow. beat all the 1500 cc cars and finished 20th overall. So is it safe to call this the very first racing Porsche? Yes, this is the very first wow. Porsche to be entered in a race as a company and then uh, the first win for Porsche uh, both uh, you know on an international platform and, and you know as a, as a company. Of course it begs the question why doesn't Porsche own this car. I mean, they have the museum. Do you think this would be a point of pride as you go in the door, the first automobile? But I guess they were just old racing cars that were sold. Is that what it was? They really were. And there is a car in the museum that uh, is painted to look like this car. It's a representation of, of the winning car. Uh, that particular car is an original 356 SL, but it was a car that was entered in 1952. Uh, what happened was, you know, in the early days of Porsche, not everything was documented like we do today. Mm -hmm. And after this car competed at Le Mans, it did a rally and then also did some uh, speed record stuff at Montlhery. And then Porsche prepared the cars and sold them to the US. So Max Hoffman, who was the importer at the time, brought the three cars to the US. And this particular car was purchased by John von Neumann, who was oh, a sure. race car driver, sure. de Porsche dealership owner here in Southern California. And he raced the car uh, starting, um, well, he raced at Pebble Beach, at Golden Gate Park, and then Torrey Pines, and then decided that he wanted to lighten the car up. Yeah. So he cut the roof off. Hey. Well, but it was know, just an old race car. It was an old race it? car at the yeah. time. And uh, so the car has been here in California uh, since 1952 with the roof cut off. And uh, many of, everybody has seen the car for years at the Monterey Historics as a little red roadster that uh, a gentleman named Chuck Forge raced for years. And uh, Chuck purchased the car in 1957 and raced it uh, until he passed in 2009. Wow. Uh, so it's been a convertible. So obviously you didn't find the original roof. Did you have to fabricate this roof? We did. So um, a very good friend of mine and actually my, my first client, uh, Cameron Healy, who I built a car for in, uh, my dad and I built a car for him in 1994. Um, he's always been very fond of this car. And when we knew that it became available, Cameron purchased the car and he loved it as a roadster. Uh, but when we uh, 
had a hunch that there was uh, the potential of it being the Le Mans winning car, we spent a couple of years doing extensive research and uh, both Cameron and myself and uh, a handful of other researchers to really uncover the history of the car because we didn't want to just put a roof back on it right. because it had so much valuable history right here in California as a race mm -hmm. car. And uh, once we determined that it was in fact the Le Mans winning car, then it was time to, to figure out how we can make it exactly period back to that point in time as it raced Le Mans. So, so does Porsche recognize it as the race winning car? They do. So once we uh, presented all the evidence and the information, then uh, a good friend of ours uh, helped us uh, present that to Porsche. And at that time, they invited the car to be uh, on display at Rennsport Reunion, which was sure. a, a very large Porsche event in September of 2015. And they had the car on display at Rennsport Reunion in bare aluminum and steel. So the car is aluminum body and steel door and chassis. Or chassis, and so we actually displayed it at Rensport Reunion in, in bare aluminum, and Porsche made that part of their heritage wow. display uh, honoring Le Mans. I mean, when you think of all the times Porsche has won Le Mans, I mean, Le Mans I associate primarily with Ferrari and Porsche. Of course, later Audi and a few others, but those, and this is the very first one. I mean, this is yeah. the thing that's, had they lost that race and got blown out of the water, who knows what might have happened, but they didn't. Exactly. They, know, it's pretty amazing. They were victorious and uh, that gave them the confidence to continue on and, and it's my understanding that they're the only car company that has entered Le Mans every year since 1951. Is that right? Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. So tell me what was involved in making this roof. This is not, I mean, did you try to find the original sort of aluminum from the period? Did you mix different, you know what I'm saying? I mean, how you don't just put a roof on, do you? You don't, and the first thing that we had to do was develop the shape because uh, all these cars were slightly different. They're all handmade, and so there's certain characteristics about the cars that are different. So uh, fortunately, there are a couple of other cars uh, from the period that still exist that we were able to use 3D scanning technology. Uh, we used a ferro arm and, and some, some technology to be able to scan parts of the other cars and then take all of that information and compare it to photographic evidence and be able to determine exactly the shape that we should build. And then from there, we were able to build the wood buck that we needed to, uh, to form the roof. So the car is 80% original, all the lower aluminum, right. the chassis is all the original steel. We had to repair you know, a few little rust areas and obviously race damage over the years. But um, the main thing that we had to recreate was from you know, this right. area up. So including the dash and the roof, the, the bumpers, the fender skirts, and some of the inner structure. And we did that by leveraging technology, but then going back to traditional methods using power hammers to create it. And when it was raced in period, it was raced with glass windows, right? Uh, it was with glass windshield. Right. So the two windshields are glass, but okay. all the other uh, windows are acrylic or, oh, or I plastic. See. Oh, yeah. I see. Oh, okay, okay. And I like the fact that I know it's a little ding down here, but you kept this because the original car had that, didn't it? Yeah, so the, the idea with this car was not to over-restore it. I mean, uh, we wanted to really restore it exactly back to a period in time as it raced. And uh, we spent a tremendous amount of time looking at photographic evidence and, and, and also the, the, the information that the body told us, you know, once we stripped all the paint off and discovering stuff. But, you know, the, everything down to the door gaps, uh, the, the hand-fit hood, the, the ding, as you mentioned here, as this car started Le Mans, the reason that ding is there is because as you, as you take the skirt on and off, it flexes it. And so that ding was there uh, as it started Le Mans in 1951. And it really is automotive archaeology because you need to find these are the exact type of fasteners that they had. They are. And, and so there was a tremendous amount of effort that went into the fasteners on the entire car all the finishes, how things were finished. Now, do you have to manufacture your own fasteners? Or we, do those still exist? No, we had to manufacture them. Uh, there's a company actually right here in the valley that, that makes uh, some of the screws that we were able to, to then put in the lathe and, and turn down to give it the rest of the finish that we needed. But uh, yeah, we, there was a lot of time spent in researching every little fastener, every little detail. Because even the paint looks, it doesn't look like the Pebble Beach Concourse paint. This is exactly the way it was done, this sort of matte, flat, kind of silver gray. It is. Uh, you know, the, these were race cars. And right. so, you know, they finished their testing, they painted them, they 
uh, put numbers on them and they went racing. And so there's another uh, car in, in Europe that is being restored. And as they were taking that car apart, they found an original panel mm -hmm. that had been uh, covered with a little bit of, uh, of undercoating. So we were able to clean that. Myself and, and uh, uh, another uh, individual that's restoring one of the other cars, we took that information and determined exactly what the paint finish was like okay, wow. and then recreated that. Because it's almost what I call rattle can paint. Yeah. Know? But I mean, I mean, it looks got to be in a negative way. I just mean it, it doesn't have that concourse pebble beach. I mean, it looks like in a race car, paint is not your primary right. thing. So you, you do a good job, you make it look adequate and it's fun, you know, but it, it's like sort of, it almost looks modern in that so many people now are going for that matte black, or right. that flat silver. I almost said, oh, is this a modern paint? But that's the way they did it, huh? It is. It's a, it's okay. a, it's a satin finish, not uh, a super glossy finish. And I'm amazed how standard or factory standard the interior is. There's no Raccaro type lightweight bucket seat or anything. It's just a nice big comfortable Porsche seat, isn't it? Well, they were seats that were specifically built for these cars. So the, the driver's seat is a, uh, is a bucket type seat that they created for the SLs and then upholstered. Originally, uh, the seat was vinyl and then this is at a time when uh, they didn't run seat belts. Right. And so um, uh, a first-hand account from uh, one of the, the mechanics that was involved in building these cars, Herbert Linga, uh, informed us that the seat was taken back to Reuter and it was upholstered in a textile material so that it had more grip. Right. And uh, just amazing discoveries as we were going through the process of restoration. Not on this only spot. no seatbelt, no roll bar, no aluminum roof, and even helmets were like helmet. What are you going to crash, Larry? You know, I mean, they, I mean, the guys used to smoke cigarettes and drive these things. They did, and yeah. and, uh, and I mean, even the passenger seat it reclines because as they were bringing the car from Germany into France. Uh, the passenger seat reclined so that the driver could sleep in the car at night uh, as they were going. Now, is that a fuel filter that I see, or is that an oil filter? Well, Porsche, you know, just like today, they're big on redundancy, making right. sure that they have uh, what they need to win a race. And so there's a few things about this car that you'll look at and you'll see extras of. For one, that fuel pump that you're pointing to was an electric fuel pump system. So the okay. car, just like their regular go road-going cars, have a mechanical fuel pump system. Right. This has a valve and an electric fuel pump so that if the mechanical pump was to fail, they can turn the electric pump gotcha. on. Uh, just like the windshield wiper, there's an extra wiper above the driver's oh, I see. Uh, right. windshield yeah. uh, that has another wiper in the toolbox in the back so that if those wipers fail, then they have uh, uh, another and wiper. It, it, and what does it weigh? It's incredible. Uh, 13, thir roughly 1,350 pounds. Wow. So it's steel chassis and uh, aluminum panels so that there are a few steel panels on the car. The bumpers, the doors, and these quarter windows are actually steel, but the rest of the car is all aluminum. Now why the need to have uh, this metal, oh, to get heat out of the car? I see there's no window here. It's not just covering a window, it's covering the, okay. That's correct. So they, yeah. there's a vent in the front of the car that is operated by a cable so that uh, they can go ahead and, and get airflow through the car. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at the back of the vehicle. Come around here. Well, here we are at the business end of the car. Let's look at the rear here. A couple of things come to mind. What do we have here? These are two lights? Yeah, those are both lights to light up the number because this was 1951 and there wasn't much light on the racetrack at Le Mans. And also there weren't things like A and B transponders and things right. to do the scoring. And so it was left up to uh, somebody to physically score the car. So they wanted to make sure they had the number very well lit. And was that the original, are those the numbers that, that, that they ran? That is. So that is a manufacturer's plate. So as they drove the car from Germany to Le Mans, they had to, uh, they had to run their plate. And so that's the manufacturer plate and the number that the car had on it at that point in time. Now these early uh, Porsches, did they have outside hinges or was it just the race car that had it? They didn't. So the early uh, Gamun 356s had an internal hinge and latch. but. Porsche wanted to make sure that the mechanics on pit lane had quick, easy access to right. the engine. And they're also flip over hinges so that if you need to, the deck lid will flip all the way over and lay on the back window so that they can I get see. in and make adjustments. Uh, the running light and the, the turn signal light. And then the brake light is in the center. Oh, just one brake light. Just one brake light. light. Okay. Just so like the early Amber for the right hand side? 
Well, the cars had different colored lights so that the team knew which car was coming in. Now, I see. they only started the event with one car, but if they, uh, if they had two cars, those lights helped them to indicate which car was coming in. Explain this. Yeah, so the deck lid itself has additional air vents put in it. So they didn't do louvers externally on the deck lid like you mm -hmm. saw Porsche do on their GT cars right. later, but they knew they needed more air, so they actually put these holes in, and that was on the build sheet for these cars, yeah. uh, to punch these holes to allow more air to come now in Now why not lid. just lose this piece all? Why not just have this, just have the brace run here and here? Why have the two holes there? Why not just have this open from here to here? What was the thinking? Well, it's an aluminum deck lid, and it's yeah. very light and very flimsy, and okay. so this, along with these two bridges, create the structural integrity of the right. deck lid. So they, they left that internal inner structure in there, but they put those holes in it. And it's so funny, you know, you can't really tell an early Porsche race motor from a production motor. I mean, externally, everything looks pretty much the same. What are you looking at here, about 40 horsepower? Yeah, just, uh, just over 40, so okay. about 45 horsepower. And, and there's a few differences on this engine from the production engines. If you, if you notice, there's the big oil filter mm -hmm. console on the back wall, which actually has a very large filter. Is that bigger than stock to hold it is. more oil so? Yeah, so it's okay. twice the size. Okay. Uh, it also has an additional coil on the back wall, which was another one of those Porsche redundancy oh, items. Oh, in case so that, something, yeah, okay. In case they had a problem. Now, how about, uh, what are the car, are those Solexes? They're Solexes, okay, yes. They're, yeah, yeah. they're early 40 Solexes. And the mechanical fuel pump and then electric fuel pump. Correct. Up front, okay. Yeah. Boy, nicely so, 1100 done. cc, yeah. uh, so very small and uh, very similar to the early Volkswagen engine, but... Uh, I know, but we always think of racing Porsches having the, the Hearth crankshaft, the, mm -hmm. the Carrera motor with the exotic, but this is a push rod a push based on Volkswagen technology at the time, wasn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's very similar to the Volkswagen technology, but it's got uh, dual port heads and, and uh, you know, better distributor, better carb ratio. Right, right, and, uh, very cool. Yeah. Well, let's close this up. Let's look under the hood okay. in the front. Is there a mechanical release inside? No, just like the rear deck lid, everything needed to be able to be accessed and open okay. from the outside on pit lane. So Porsche installed hood straps to keep the front bonnet down. You know, it's funny. You always think of pit stops now being three seconds, two and a <laughs> half seconds. I mean, you think there'd be some quick release there, but no. It's no, it was probably one of the mechanics belts that they cut up to, okay. to create that. Enormous. How big is that tank? This tank is uh, roughly 16 gallons. Well, that's all. It looks bigger than that. Okay. The, maybe. Yeah, the original tank would have, uh, or the original street road going car tanks were only about 11 gallons. And okay. so Porsche built a special tank for the car. And obviously you can fill it without opening the hood. Correct. So yeah. the only reason to open the hood really would be to change the tire, correct? Yeah, to change the tire or access the battery or anything under the car. Right, and you have your stone guards here, protect the lights. Yeah. And what is that there? What is that piece of... This uh, piece of hose here? Yeah. Well, uh, these are six volt systems, so uh, the car you know, didn't have a whole lot of light. And so Porsche installed fog lights or driving lights in the front and did their best to light the car up as much as possible. But when they were making the adjustment, uh, obviously they ran out of uh, the adjustment they needed to aim that driving light at right. the apex. So one of the mechanics shoved a piece of hose in there to get it uh, angled and and because we restored this to a ex exact period in time we wanted to make sure that was there did they have to be six volts because production cars are six volts or well that was the everybody knew 12 volts was better obviously even in the 30s you know bentley was doing 12 volts so i'm always surprised that they stayed with six volts i thought they go to 12 in the racing cars i mean is it based on a production vehicle, so it must be six volts? Was that the rule? Correct. And okay. all of Porsche, uh, Porsche kept that six volt all the way through the 356s until the very end. Right. Um, and then they switched over to 12 volts. And you can see the hand fettling here. Look at this. It, it's a bit rough in here, where it's all just kind of hand hammered. And, and and we wanted to make sure when we were restoring this that we left that character because that's how they yeah. were. Even under the hood, you can see some of the power hammer marks from when they were making the hood originally. Right. So we just wanted to make sure that we that we left all that character uh, because that's the way it was. Now, this is horn? Yeah, so that hole actually serves as two purposes. It, the horn is behind there, but also the main reason is there's an air vent right below that line that is operated by a cable underneath the dash because, you know, these cars generate some heat just like all cars do, and they had the quarter window vents to get air out. This was the air in. And they actually put it below the surface so that if there was rain, it wasn't going to just come right into the cockpit. 
uh, but this created a, a the whole bumper created a. a see, a my guess would have been oil cooler. Yeah, but you know these engines, the 1100cc engine, and the way that uh, Porsche developed their fan shroud, they didn't generate uh, a tremendous amount of heat. And even though they're, you know, they're oil and air cooled, uh, the regular oil cooler on the engine um, was was good enough for oh, these cars. Oh, I see. Okay. So there's no external oil cooler. Again, we have a clear light on this side, amber light on the front, and that side. Each team car was different. Well, there, yeah. There, it's all black and white photos, but we were able yeah. to determine that, that the colors of those lights were a different color. Look at the car. And of course, the split windshield, which was, which most cars had back in the day. Curved glass didn't really come along until much later. Yeah, it wasn't until 1953 that Porsche started putting yeah. a bent windshield in the cars. So there are two individual glass windshields. I always liked it. When you broke a windshield, you have to replace the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Just replace one side. <laughs> cool. Now we can't really see the wheels. Four lug, five lug? They're five lugs, so okay. just like the Volkswagen and early Porsche mm -hmm. uh, bolt pattern, drum brakes. They actually used uh, the old steel VW drums, but they, they put, or type drums, Cast but they put liner. aluminum, aluminum. Uh, finned uh, sleeves that went on the outside to dissipate more heat. And I imagine brake fade must have been huge in these back in the day, wasn't it? It was, and you know, the, the, the brakes themselves are, uh, you know, uh, hydraulic brakes. The wheels are three and a quarter inch, so very narrow right. by 16 and, and not much tires. And what was top speed of this car? Uh, just over 100 miles an a hour. Over 100 miles an hour. Okay. It averaged uh, 74 miles an hour for uh, 24 hour, or in the 24 hour race and traveled uh, just over 1,700 miles. Porsche knew that they needed to make this car as slippery yeah. as possible, that, which is why it has these uh, wheel spats on it, as well as aero plates underneath it the It does car. have a belly pan? It does. So there's a belly pan up in the front that goes okay. all the way back to the pedal area, and then additional uh, aero plates behind the rear wheels. So they really spent a lot of time trying to make it as slippery as possible. Well, we are going to take this out. He's going to take this out for a ride, because the value of this car, I'm told, is one gazillion dollars. <laughs> so having me drive and go, oh, I'm sorry, I hit a tree. So we're going to take it out, but I'm going to sit in the passenger seat and feel what it's like to ride in the Le Mans winning very first Porsche racing car. Pretty amazing. This is going to be cool. But let's go over the starting procedure, okay? Let's, let's, uh, it looks pretty much uh, standard Porsche of the period, but there are a few things I'm not familiar with, so let's take a look at those. Let's start off with the dash. Go through the controls. So Porsche took the standard Gamoon dash, but configured it a little differently for a race car. They put this removable panel here that has all the switches and the kill switch buttons, as well as they had to add additional gauges, which is why it has this extra planted on uh, gauge cluster. Okay. So this is the, the power switch, so this right. turns it on. Kind of right. a unique little key, it's just more or less a pin. Right. That turns the power on, and then we have a start button over here. So okay. at Le Mans, they would have turned the power on, run to the car and hit the button. This one is what, lights, I assume? Uh, so this is uh, turn indicators. Oh, turn indicators. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, we have the speedometer, which is in kilometers, and then the generator light, the oil pressure light, and then the high beam indicator. Uh, temperature gauge, which is actually operated by a, uh, you pull the dipstick out and there's a, a mechanical uh, dipstick that goes in that, that oh, reads cool. the temperature, and uh, the tachometer. And then this is the windshield washer pump. Oh, so okay. there's actually a pump. The bottle over on your uh, right-hand side uh, is the glass bottle that held the w windshield washer fluid. Okay. And then this knob down here, the B, that is that uh, air vent for the front. So you I actually pull you. it out and twist it to lock it into position. So uh, and then and this one. Uh, so you've got headlights. Okay. And then um, you've got a, uh, a fuel kill switch. And That's this one. This is the fuel kill switch okay, here. Yeah. So you've got the, the electronic uh, you know, fuel. And then this is the fog light switch. Gotcha. And then windshield wiper. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, that's the fuel. And then this one is the interior light. Okay. And what is this one? Uh, this is just a uh, cigarette, cigarette lighter. lighter. Well, in, in case, case you want to yeah. have a smoke while you're out okay. there. And do they use turn signals at Le Mans? Well, but this is a this has to be a street legal road going car. Okay. So it and has of course, turn signal your switch. glove box right here. Huh? Yeah, which is a little stiff, but there you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Very so good. Pretty straightforward. And, and the horn. All right. Horn. Let's uh, let's start it up. Okay. Let's fire it up. Uh, it 
it's got a lot of camshaft. You can hear that it's uh, yeah. You know, it's such a small motor that they really did everything they could to get as much power out of it. So it doesn't have a whole lot of bottom end. It, uh, right. I imagine you probably use the brakes right a little when you're racing this because you need all the inertia to keep going, don't you? Yeah, so it's like you, racing a Miata. It's yeah, all about yeah. momentum. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very cool that it's the actual car. I mean, that really makes it exciting. Well, for me, it was an important car to be able, and, and a very special car for me to be able to do the restoration on because, yeah. you know, this is Porsche's first car that they took one of their road going cars and modified for racing. Right. And did so many of the things that I've been doing for years on my Outlaws. Yeah, yeah. Hood straps and fog lights. And, yeah. Uh, you know, all those things that people have been giving me a hard time for all these yeah, years. Yeah, well, yeah. I got to restore yeah. the car that started it all. So I guess in a sense, what I've been doing all these years really isn't uh, any different than what Porsche did in 1951. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you imagine 1,700 miles in this little thing? Yeah. In 24 hours. Well, I, it's comfortable enough. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're out in the elements and you're getting beat up. So the air actually comes through the center yeah, tunnel. Yeah, I can feel it, yeah. And it comes in. It's like driving an old tractor. <laughs> well, not quite a tractor, but <laughs> it's fun to see the. Because you know, if you're into automobiles, you want to know what came before that, what came before that. You know, whenever you talk to young kids, they want to know about the latest La Ferrari or P1 or Lamborghini. And then as you get more and more educated, what came before that? Then you go back to the Mura. I know of Lamborghini guys that that want to have the tractor because that came before the car. Right. You know, and this is the whole history of the company in a nutshell. I mean, if this car had not been successful, who knows what might have happened? You know, would it just been another car company like NSU or any of these others that came and went, you know? So well, it this, really is the, the forerunner. Well, this was at a period in time when they had just moved back to Germany. Yep. They had just ordered a whole uh, lot of steel-bodied 356s from Reuter. And you can only imagine, they, they put all their eggs in one basket, showed up at yep. the mall with two cars, and the feeling they must have had when they crashed the number 47 yeah. car and knowing they were going to start the race with only one race. Yeah. Only one car, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start the race with only one car. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the level of that German craftsmanship is really something. You know, even on my 63 Carrera 2, the door shuts so perfectly, everything works. You know, you can run incredible mileage in these things. There's so many exotic cars at 30,000 miles they're worn out or considered need to be rebuilt. Where Porsches, I see guys with Porsches with 160,000 miles on 911s, 200,000 miles, still going strong. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to a guy the other day that that said that there's a car here in California that has been daily driven for over 40 years, a 356, that yeah. just went a million miles. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's amazing that they, they just keep going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. These tires feel a little flat spotted. Yeah, it's uh, you know they're they're old. Yeah, are, the, are these the tires? These the are, this is this is the set of tires that was on the rims when we got the car. Wow. That are uh, they're you know they're uh, from the 50s. They're a vintage set of tires. Wow. New tubes, but they yeah, were yeah. Uh, they were well kept. And, yeah. Uh, the idea was that we went when uh, we finished the car and took it to Pebble Beach. We wanted to uh, make sure that we had period tires on it. The 912, a five-speed? It was. They, yeah. Well, they had a four-speed and a five-speed yeah. available right. for the 912. A lot of people like those 912s, and they build up the motor. Yeah, they're great. You know, the 912 engine is very similar to the 356 engine. It's just the later evolution of it. Right. And, uh, uh, and then, you know, you've got guys that are uh, that are really starting to, to develop those engines, like John Wilhoyt that you've had on your yes, show a few yes, times. Yeah. The engine that he puts in his 356s is uh, an amazing engine. To be in the actual car that won the very first race that Porsche ever ran, what a treat this is. Well, I really appreciate you having us on the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for bringing it. The owner's probably sweating bullets we're out driving around in this thing. How were the internals? Was the engine pretty good? Did it need new pistons and everything? The Le Mans engine was pulled out after Le Mans, and then they put an engine in it for Montfleury and Liège, Rome Liège. Oh, and then I they see. put a detuned engine in them when they sent them here. Uh, 
over to the U.S. But yeah, we had to build the engine, transmission, and all the brakes, uh, find all those parts and components that were that were long gone on the car. So yeah, we had to recreate the dashboard, glove box, all those yeah. little details. Automotive archaeology was a big part of this car because yeah. there were so many unanswered questions yeah. and so many things that that needed to be discovered not only on this car but also the other cars that surrounded this because yeah. in order for us to be confident in knowing what the history of this car was we needed to know the, the other cars that were yeah. put together for Le Mans. And well. the fun thing is being a Porsche you could drive this anywhere. Yeah. I mean you could drive this to Laguna Seca if you wanted to. You could. I would have thought the brakes would overheat with those side skirts on the front. Well, but if, I don't know if you took a look and saw how inboard those front wheels are from the skirts oh, I see. Oh, for turning yeah. radius, so oh, there's I actually see. quite a bit of flow. But the way that they did the, so they used a drum like the early, the earliest Porsche drum or VW type steel drum, but they pressed an aluminum sleeve over them with fins on it to dissipate oh, the I heat. See. Yeah, yeah, like a Buick. Uh, exactly. Buick had that fin. So it was all to just help dissipate yeah. that heat. Might as well see what it feels like at yeah. low speed. Not that it goes that well, fast, but it, but it's geared pretty high, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Because they wanted to be able to, uh, yeah. you know, get that top speed. Yeah. And we're going to meet the owner of this automobile. He's uh, been sweating bullets watching us drive around it. <laughs> This is the owner, Cameron Healy. Cameron, how are you? I'm great, Jay. Now you're great now that we stopped. I'm breathing easier Were now. you sweating bullets? Were you no, a little nervous? I wasn't sweating. I was enjoying just watching in motion. I mean, a car like this in LA traffic, this is probably the most expensive car in the history of LA traffic. So. Well, I don't know about that, but I was, but, I was watching every car went by. Though. But was this the dream Porsche you always wanted? This was, uh, you know, there's a lot of dream Porsches I've had, but yeah. this one, because Le Mans is such a great historical uh, event and uh, because this of uh, this has that Le Mans original Le Mans history this this is by far the most interesting is car it, I've been involved with it, is there any chance this car will ever go back to Le Mans well Jay that's uh, the dream is yeah. to uh, take it back to Le Mans uh, for the 24 hours and uh, do a lap of honor in it uh, I'd love to drive it around for that uh, being that it's Porsche's first uh, first time at Le Mans and, and how it's such a Porsche is such an important part of of Le Mans history. Well, thanks for saving a great piece of automotive history. And Rod, thanks for doing a wonderful restoration. I mean, it's almost impossible to mount, to guess how many hours, 3,000 hour? I don't know, I can't imagine. There was probably 3,000 hours in uh, automotive archeology span yeah. in, in validating everything, and then there was the restoration. Okay, so remember, you can't restore these things over a weekend like you see on a lot of those other <laughs> shows, okay? It takes a long time. We'll see you guys next week, thanks. Mm-hmm. <laughs>